we're going to do some basic introductions, everyone, with kind of everyone on our team here. They're going to kind of share, um, you know, how long they've been working remote in some previous positions before they started working at Headway, just a little intro to who they are, and where they're from, and what they do. Um, and then we'll kind of jump into some basic questions for each of them, sharing like their first remote experience, you know, how have the tools kind of changed over time since they started, you know, biggest benefit to remote work in their opinion and the biggest challenge in their opinion and all sharing that. Um, and then um, we'll open up for Q&A. So don't, I mean, you can ask some questions, I guess, if you think of them, um, but we'll answer those later. Um, so we'll do our best to manage those and, uh, and answer those uh, as best as we can. So. So uh, we appreciate any, any of your patience and uh, thanks again for being here. Um, and actually, if you submit them through the Q&A um, through Zoom, uh, we'll get them stored up and I can sort through them ahead of time. Cool. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I think I think we can get started. Um, all right. So we'll start with um, we'll start with Jordan. All right, Jordan, if you want to intro yourself and uh, share a little bit about um, who you are, how long you've been working remote, and kind of like, or just, you know, how you kind of got into remote work and how you got ended up uh, at Headway. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jordan Burke. Uh, I am based in Athens, Georgia, um, and I've been working remotely on and off for, what is it, 2020? So for about 11, 12 years. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, with startups here in Athens and also with startups based in Atlanta. So a lot of my remote experience has been uh, working with companies based out of Atlanta, uh, either on a contract basis or a part-time basis. Um, but my first remote experience was working for a, uh, a pastor up in upstate New York. And uh, it was kind of a nightmare. Um, it was 2009. And I don't think Google Hangouts had reached its, uh, its maturity yet. Um, and we pretty much did everything over the phone and sending emails back and forth. And I didn't work remotely for a couple of years after that. Um, I'll, uh, and I'll say this too, uh, moving into remote work and, and the maturity of, of the Zoom platform specifically, like I'm not sponsored, this is not a plug. Um, but Zoom has made it a lot easier to be a remote worker. Uh, Google Hangouts kind of made it a, a pain, um, but Zoom has made it a lot easier. Um, biggest benefits to remote work, obviously, is flexibility, I would say. Um, I like being able to work from home or from an office that I have in downtown Athens or from a coffee shop. Um, the biggest challenge with that is also the flexibility of working from home or from a coffee shop or from my office in downtown Athens. Um, always on the move and never having all the things that you need at, at hand uh, most of the time. So uh, yeah, that's me and I, I'll, I guess, hand it back to you, Jacob, for who's next. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's see. Let's see. It, we'll do Clint since the, the hail is approaching. The hail storm is approaching. <laughs> yeah, it's about to get wild here in Oklahoma. Um, yeah, no, so I, I've been with Headway for coming up on a year, actually. So in April, and, uh, I would say I, it's been my full kind of first fully remote, um, work in a lot in a while when I was freelancing about eight years ago, um, remote work was, I was doing that, but it was much more difficult. Um, I was working with couple of friends who were developers and lived in different parts of the state. Uh, one friend actually um, traveled the entire world in, during that time. Um, and uh, we built websites together and all those things, but it was much more difficult. Um, like, like Jordan mentioned, Zoom's come a long way. Um, just video conferencing in general has come a long way. Um, so yeah, not, not quite new to it, but um, again, you know, it, it, it is, um, it's always changing. And I think the tools have gotten better. Um, the experience has gotten better. Um, and we're just the fact that we're all kind of intentionally always trying to connect with one another through Slack or zoom or whatever just makes the experience. Uh, I think it, 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 it has its ups and downs. I think, um, you know, it, I'm trying to think of like, um, trying to think of some good experience, some good thought. Well, I guess one thing is just kind of coming off of a project. We just, we just wrapped up. There's been some like just kind of new learnings. I think for me in general, kind of being used to um, uh, 
working side by side with an engineer, for example, at past companies, like working right in the room and kind of being able to, to pass off ideas and to uh, um, versus remote. Um, there is uh, some proactive like intentionality that you have to take, I think a little bit more. Um, I think there can be some assumptions that things can fall by the wayside if you're not really, um, you know, heads up and, and communicating as much as possible through Figma comments or if it's through Slack or if you're recording a video walkthrough, whatever it is, I think intentionality is one of those big, uh, important things. So um, that's one of the big lessons I think I've learned in the past year uh, is just being, I think, over intentional, like, like over communicating, um, you know, and, and not, not being shy about that. So um, let's see, what else? Who, who, who wants to go next? Anybody else want to, want to go? I'm going to pick on, I'm going to pick on Kelsey. Hey everybody. Um, I am a developer, uh, calling from Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, I've been working remote my whole career. Um, I started working for a company, um, actually still in college. So I was doing part, I was finishing out my degree and working from home and then continue to work for them afterward. It was very low tech. It was like Jordan said, um, on the phone and emails going back and forth. And we were a pretty small team. So we were able to manage it. Like I was the only developer and just working with subject matter experts. Um, but then I came to work for Headway and it's much more high tech zoom life changer using Slack so much easier. Um, also for benefits, uh, for me personally, um, for the past, basically since I got out of school, my husband and I have been moving around the country and, um, my job just comes with me. So it's been a major you know, advantage. Um, and it was one thing that I knew that was kind of on our horizon. And so um, when the opportunity to start working remote, like in college came up, I, I jumped at it. Um, probably my biggest challenge is uh, I can just sit right here like all day long and not like get up and, you know, walk around and do things. And so I have to be really intentional about that. Same with like just leaving the house regularly. Um, so yeah, you can, it can be great because you have the flexibility, but sometimes you're just working all the time. Um, and I guess since we're popcorning now, I'll call on Alex. I knew you were going to call me, Kelsey. I knew it. Um, so hey, everybody. Um, my name is Alex. Um, I live in Buffalo, New York. Well, Hamburg, New York, which is a suburb, suburb of Buffalo. Um, I have worked remote for three years. So I worked one year at the end of a job. Uh, before I left and then I went back to an office and then now for the past almost two years I've worked remote again. Uh, the first remote experience was, you know, like everybody else says, this was a lot. It was extremely difficult, mostly on the phone all the time and uh, emails back and forth and PowerPoint presentations and trying to send PowerPoints to people and trying to explain something through a PowerPoint in an email is just not fun when it comes from the design side of working with and trying to help work with developers. Um, to how the tools will change, you know, I will be honest, using Figma for design has changed my life, not only as a designer, but especially remote. Um, no longer are the days of having to sketch files and upload and send them and share them and download them and make sure the updated, updated version. Yes, I know abstract was a piece of that, but just Figma eliminates all this. Um, and it creates really this core collaboration between a team and it's just between designers as well as developers. Um, and I think it's just, change the way at least I've worked and I know um, it, it enables a lot of uh, collaboration, especially in the remote setting. Um, biggest challenge or biggest benefits I would say to remote work is having the flexibility of kids. So being able to have lunch with them, that's something that I wouldn't be able to have if I had to go to an office, I'd be at an office from nine to five, sitting in an hour of traffic each way or half an hour, you know, having the ability just to get up and go to work. And then when you want to spend some time with your kids, like at lunch, that's a great opportunity for me to do that and have that availability, which is really nice, especially when they're young. Um, but again, I think like Kelsey iterated as well as Jordan too, like the challenges of like you go to different places, you know, sometimes you're not always hundred percent there, you know, or if you don't leave the house, you always feel like works there and you want to go up and work. So it's, it's a challenge a little bit, but I think if you find the right balance, it can work. So for me, just to give a tip, what I do is usually I try to spend one day a week outside of the house just so I'm not going stir crazy. Like Kelsey has like 
you know, it's just, you sit there all day and you're just every single day, but obviously now with lockdown, can't really do much. So we're here. So um, I will now call on uh, stunts. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew. A lot of people at Headway call me stunts though. So if you hear people calling me stunts, that's a nickname. Well, we have three Andrews, so that's why <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I've been <laughs> I've been working at Headway for uh, about a year and a half now. Um, and I've been working full-time remote for three or so years now. Um, Although I like when I was remote for a while and then I was in an office for a while and then I was remote again. So it's maybe like five years total remote. Um, but most of that time has been spent working remotely, like from my dining room table or from uh, the couch or, or different coffee shops. So um, that's been interesting and fun. Though so recently I got a nice big office. So that's been really wonderful and nice, but uh, yeah. I think the biggest benefits to remote work for me are the flexibility. I know people talk a lot about that, but it's kind of ridiculous how much more flexible you can be if you don't have to commute or like go into an office at all. And it's not to be undersold. Um, whereas from challenges, I think, my biggest frustration is that sometimes I get sucked into work a lot and I'll end up sitting in my office in the dark until midnight working on something that I should put away um, just because I don't maybe don't have some anything else to do or never got out of the house that day. So um, I know a lot of my friends are like, oh, you work remote. How do you ever get work done? I would not ever work in my house. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. You have I, I don't stop working some days. So um, to me, the problem is the opposite, but yeah. Oh, I forgot to say where I was living. I live in Bellingham, Washington. So I'm in the Pacific time zone. That's one challenge that is not ideal. Um, but working, I work uh, like 7.30 a.m. to 3.34 Pacific time. So my hours are a little funky. And even then, I still feel like I'm getting up and at work after um, the rest of the headway folk. Or if we work with people on Eastern time, then it's really bad. But uh, yeah. on the other hand, if we're working with people in the Pacific time zone, I can stick around until later or work things around. But yeah. I'll pass that off to Jess. Yeah, hi, I'm Jess Tadola and I live in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and I've been working remotely now for about four years. I started working for Comcast as a software engineer right after graduation as a junior developer. So, and I was really fortunate to be mentor mentored by a number of very patient and kind senior engineers. Um, so I've been at Headway now for the last year. Uh, my first remote experience was a mix of good and bad. It, it took some time to get used to being alone all day, but I learned how to supplement that by pair programming with other people, working from coffee shops when I felt super isolated, or going to meetups or conferences in the area. So uh tools changed i guess tools haven't really changed that much in the last four years i mean zoom has the cool backgrounds like jordan has you know so you can do that but um i am very partial to zoom over google hangouts and other tools just because it allows you to see everyone that's on the call at the same time which gives a similar effect to being in a meeting room where you would be able to see everybody's face at the same time uh, the biggest benefits to working remotely for me is uh, there's no commute, so I get a lot, I get more of my day back. And if the kids are sick, I don't need to call in, I can still work. Um, and the ability to be focused is probably the biggest thing because I am easily distracted by things going on around me. So when I'm at home by myself, I'm a lot less inclined to chit chat with others because there's really nobody to chit chat with. Um, and then 
The other thing is just really the opportunity. Uh, there's very few places where I live that I can work and the salary that is offered isn't nearly as competitive as what it is in the, the cities surrounding me um, or even throughout the country, right? Um, and I get the opportunity to work with a greater variety of technology. Um, but the biggest challenge for me is that is just being alone. I'm an extroverted introvert. So while being around a lot of people can get overwhelming for me, I still really need to be in contact with people. And so working on projects with a small team with minimal communication can leave me feeling a bit isolated, but I know that about myself. So I'm diligent about being aware of my levels of feeling isolated and make sure that I take preemptive measures to make sure that I don't uh, let it take over by pulling people into calls or joining Slack channel chats, et cetera. And um, Keith, you asked uh, in which scenario does your day feel like it goes by faster or slower? I've worked in offices long before I got into computer science and I have to say, my days go by so much faster working from home just because I'm not thinking about getting home, right? Because I'm already here. So my days just fly by. And on that note, I will pass it off to um, Andrew Hooker. Hi, uh, so I'm Andrew Hooker. I live in Algoma, Wisconsin. So I'm about 45 minutes from the Headway office. Uh, so I work remote a majority of the time. Uh, I've been working remote for about eight years um, with Headway for two. Um, I had to go back and, and kind of Google the history of things. So my first remote work, uh, we were using IRC. Um, and Slack came along uh, relatively early even at that job. Uh, so we were definitely like, you know, early users of Slack there. Um, video has changed a lot more. Um, go to Google Hangouts, uh, go to meeting, uh, lots of t tools, you know, again, I would say that are inferior to Zoom, um, you know, for, for doing that kind of work. Um, my first remote job was actually with an open source company uh, and where I had gotten to know them before getting the job uh, through IRC, kind of through the open source side. So I kind of knew, um, you know, what I was getting, getting into and knew who I was going to be working with, which was a big help. Um, that, much like Headway, was kind of a split uh, with people centralized in an office as well as people remote. Um, didn't do it nearly as well as, as Headway does. Um, there were a lot of things that they did on site that there was no remote equivalent component to, um, which, you know, as a remote person was not, not ideal. Um, when we were out for, um, like, you know, when we had to be on site at the office, um, the on-site people tended to go home at five o'clock. And so us, we, like those of us who were in remote, you know, entertained ourselves, uh, which again, not really, not really the goal. Um, so there are a lot of things, a lot of things that, you know, make a big difference, um, you know, just in terms of um, including, you know, being conscious of how the rest of the team, you know, the team that is not, not local, um, you know, can be included in things. Um, Zoom obviously is a big, a big component of that. Um, most of our meetings, uh, people dial in even in the office from their desk. So much like you're seeing us here today, you know, you'll see, <clears throat> you'll see the back of people that are on, that are on that same call, you know, cause they're in the same room, but they're dialed in, which means they've got their own microphone, they've got their own camera, um, you know, so you can have that more personal interaction um i think i covered pretty much everything yeah that's awesome yeah um yeah i think like having cameras on is such a is so helpful like when you have a bunch of people on a call it's just kind of hard to connect with people and understand even if they're paying attention or um you know where they where they even are like on the call so um yeah and i'm billy i'm gonna have you actually share 
um, your experience just because you obviously work with folks that are remote um, and just kind of share your experience a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I'm Billy Sweetman. I work in the uh, Green Bay office, uh, full-time remote as of Monday, uh, but uh, I've taken, usually work one day, one day from home uh, every week. Uh, always been in an office, but we've always worked with remote um, whether it be contractors at previous jobs that, or previous places that I was at, uh, or even some um, offshore um, contractors before. So uh, I've always worked with some sort of remote uh, component. It started same way like Andrew, a lot of IRC, FTP sites for transferring files, and it wasn't super ideal uh, for that. And the whole uh, system has just in Proved tremendously uh, with Slack, uh, Zoom, uh, like everyone just reiterating Google Hangouts tried it at first and it was okay, but it really kind of struggled. Um, I think setting up the office uh, to be remote where we're kind of dialing in from our desks helps a lot uh, to make everyone feel uh, like even though you're in the office, you're still in that remote sense and it allows us to really quickly communicate sort of to kind of echo what uh, Clint was saying is it's um, instead of going to someone's desk to chat, you're just like, hey, can I can we jump on Zoom real quick um, just to have those conversations uh, right away. Um, a lot of screen sharing and Figma has just made everything a thousand times easier uh, for everyone because now um, developers, designers, clients are all in one space. Uh, so really promoting that remote first uh, sort of uh, culture and lifestyle, even though we're in the office. Uh, I think some of the biggest benefits that, um, I mean, today uh, it was nice to take the kids for a hike outside during lunch. Uh, definitely can't do that when you're in the office. Uh, so that's definitely nice to be able to step away. Um, and I think the biggest challenge uh, I would say right now, like, is um, probably like being in the office, like mm -hmm. kind of what Andrew Hooker was saying is being sort of worried. Um, does everyone feel included with activities that are going on? Um, or like, uh, how can we do more things to hang out as a group um, online? You know, we're not in all VR space yet, but we'll get there. And then we'll all be hanging out in VR. So uh, maybe in two, three years from now, but you know, we're, we do a lot of really cool things to make uh, make sure everyone feels included, but I would say that's the, probably at least I see that as the biggest challenge. Cool. Nico is asking, he, Nico might share a little bit of his story here. I was just asking if he was ready. Um, we'll see if he jumps in or not. I can make him a panelist. Okay, cool. He's ready. So one thing uh, Billy touched on that I'll, I forgot to mention. So before, before Headway, I actually was CTO of a remote startup um, managing developers both on, on shore and off. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot, of the, a lot of the time zone issues that were mentioned, um, scheduling meetings for like that 8 a.m. window that overlapped with the offshore team. Um, so yeah, lots of experience there as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, all right, Nico, you ready? Yeah, can you can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Jumping in here. Uh, so yeah, so just a little bit of myself. Uh, my name is Nico Glennon. Uh, I'm a developer at at Headway. Um, uh, I've been a remote developer for almost two days now. Did somebody already make that joke? Uh, jumped in a little late, but um, uh, yeah. Yes, so, that joke was made. Okay, just making sure somebody did it. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm not a fully remote uh, developer like most of the people on the panel, but um, I am a, um, I usually work from home about once a week, um, as, as same as Billy. Um, and a little bit about my background, I've been with, I've been with Headway uh, for like, maybe for like seven or eight months. Um, before that, I was working remote uh, for, a, for a short time. And um, it's, 
you know, for someone who had never worked remote before, the transition was, uh, was a little bit difficult. And um, I, um, it was mostly because of the setup that I had before uh, with Headway. I feel like we have a lot of infrastructure that makes this actually really easy. Um, but um, yeah, it, it um, you know, having a remote first company have an HQ where you can go in and like jump on a Zoom call with everybody is, is was very unique and was very, um, it, it just made a lot of sense because um, if you have folks that are not remote, having a lot of people in a, in a room and then having the remote people kind of up on the screen, it, it kind of creates a separation, whether it's what we do at, at Headway, as most people have mentioned, is everybody is on the call at the same time. So it's kind of like a, a level playing field for, for all of us to feel like, uh, like we're all kind of on the same level. So it, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's the, the setup that we have at Headway, I feel like it's a really good solution for the size of our team and kind of the you know this this goal of making us all feel part of the team even though not everybody comes into the office so um yeah um that's all i got cool. um, well, well you were you were recently in colombia for like a month um a couple months ago so what was that like going i mean the time zone was the same um, yeah. but like what was that experience like not from not being in the office yeah, and still being part of the team, but just working from like your parents' house. Yeah, so so I'm originally from uh, Colombia in South America, from a city called Cali, um, and I hadn't been down there for like six months. Um, before that, for like even longer, for like almost two years. Uh, so it it had been a while since I had been able to go to see my folks. So. Um, given the fact that Hedwig was set up to be remote, um, I just uh, ran it by um, by the the leadership, and um, yeah, it was a very smooth transition. I was working from, you know, you know, another continent, pretty much, uh, really far away. Uh, luckily, on the same time zone, um, so that was probably easier for me than it was for stunts, like on a day to day, <laughs> I was on the exact same time zone. Um, but yeah, it was very smooth. Um, I was able to work for a month remotely. Uh, the biggest issue was just trying to explain to my mom that she can't knock on the door and bring me some, some coffee or something. Um, but it, you know, as I said, you know, the tools we have, um, uh, you know, we have Slack, we have Zoom, we have Figma. Um, it's it's all set up in a way that you know you can work from from anywhere. So, um, yeah, it it I think it just opened like my it opened my eyes to the possibilities of what can be done as a remote first company. Is you know people being able to you know take you know month long stints in a city that they want to explore or go visit family for longer than a weekend, uh, you know, you can do all these things uh, without having to worry about being back in the office, you know, missing work. Um, a lot of people that I know my, um, who are my age and are trying to kind of do like a weekend getaway somewhere, it's always uncomfortable to having to work from home that Monday or that Friday. It's almost like, like you're like inconveniencing your, your coworkers when it should you know, for us, it's, it's not, it's, it's just how it is every day anyway. So, um, it's just a huge advantage. So. Yeah. Great. I wish my mom would bring me coffee though. So that'd be kind of nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks Nico. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm trying to think, was there someone else that hopped in or was it just Nico the last one? I think just Nico. All right, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. There's some questions about like how do we kind of create culture and and build the team up together and you know with people being local, people being remote, how do we make that work? So I'm going to have Andrew. Um, he's one of the partners at Headway, and uh, he's going to kind of share how we kind of accomplish building a remote first culture and making sure everyone feels heard and listened to and and uh, feels involved. So.
Sounds good. I'm, I'm only laughing because my daughter was not in the room until right now. So she's, she can hopefully go away as I ignore her. But uh, yeah, so I, when we started Headway, you know, I was actually remote living in Hawaii. And so I think that, that tied into a lot of the remote first culture. You know, we had three partners in Green Bay. And so a lot of the tools that we we're looking at, you know, are remote first. But I think as we've grown from a, a team of four to, you know, right around 30 now, um, I think a lot of it's trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. I don't know if there's a perfect playbook out there, but like tooling is obviously important so you can do your job, but I think it goes beyond that. And so we do, you know, quarterly team weeks where actually this week was supposed to be one of the team weeks where the whole team was going to fly in this Sunday and Monday, and we were going to spend a week together in the office working on internal stuff together, um, working on, you know, how do we work better together as people? How do we learn about us behind, you know, beyond essentially the work that we do day to day and, you know, how can we be more collaborative and learn what work, what works and what doesn't? I think from, you know, a day-to-day -day standpoint, you know, just like if you go to the gym one day, you're not going to get ripped. But if you go every day for a long period of time, you'll get there. And so I think that type of approach to remote work um, is important. And so we try to, you know, as Nico and Andrew have said, like getting on face-to-face, -face, even if, you know, we're not, um, even if like five people are in the office and two people aren't, I think that can be kind of intimidating or feeling like off-putting if you have a bunch of people in a conference room talking to one, you know, person on a screen. It doesn't really feel like you are you have the attention of everyone in the room. So I think that um, we make a lot of uh, point to connect weekly. So we have learned some things across the team, design and development-wise, where we get together and people share things that articles or videos or things that are kind of keep us sharp and stuff to keep thinking about and then one thing we used to do friday mornings was just personal and professional best so being able to um share more of what's going on in our lives you know personally professionally little quirks and things and hear a lot of jacob's dad jokes um to kind of keep everyone light connecting on the same page i think has, has helped and we recently moved those to friday team lunches where you know we celebrate any anniversaries or birthdays and um you know kind of partner that together just to be mindful of everyone's time um, but then I think even, you know, with our clients, like the, the culture is remote first. We have clients that are down the road from us that we have on video calls. We have clients that are in, you know, kind of on the coast that are on different calls um, with us. And so I think just having that remote first mindset, making sure the tools can support it, and then, you know, getting feedback from the remote team on how we can make it better, right? There's things that happen in the office that we can't mimic remotely. So how do we, how do we bring people into that? And, you know, we don't have it all figured out, but I think just being open to, um, just figuring out what, what works best, you know, for people like Jess that are, you know, just across the state and not super far to, you know, all the way to Bellingham, you know, not, not too far from the Great White North in Canada. Um, you know, just understanding, like, how do, we, how do we bridge the gap between that experience and just bring, make everyone a part of it. Um, so I would say it's like being intentional, you know, from a culture standpoint, and then just being open to what's working and what's not and continuing to ask for feedback. Of like, how, how do we make this better? Like, you know, we don't have all the answers to it. So if we can figure it out and make, make tweaks together and say, hey, we implemented this, it didn't work the way we thought, let's try something else. And just kind of that uh, mindset of continuous learning around how we work together. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I think we can jump into some questions. Um, just to get things moving. I'm sure more questions will come up and stuff like that. Um, oh, I know what I can do. Can we switch the view to show everybody? I don't know if this, if all the attendees see like the full panel now or not, or is it not? I don't know. It's hard to know as a host. I think that's individual control. I, okay. I started, oh, they uh, see it all. Okay, yeah, cool. They just have to so switch is, it from. Yeah. So this is an example of how like a, a team call can go. Like whether it's, you know, sharing personal best and professional best on Fridays, or if it's just like maybe as a larger team for a project, this is what it can feel like. You can see everybody at the same time, or you can make it be a singular view um, on Zoom. So that's just an example. Just kind of wanted to show that quick. Um, actually, I'm going to get, see if I can get a screenshot. And, yeah. and the scale, <laughs> and the scale, the scale of it is pretty amazing. Uh, a couple of us were on a client call on Friday that had 102 people on it. And, oh yeah. I mean, you, you couldn't tell, like you wouldn't have known that there were that many people connected in. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. We'll go to the first question. Um, 
I think that's chronological, yeah. Uh, so I think, Andrew, you could probably um, answer this one, Andrew uh, Vermacour. Uh, from a management perspective, what metrics, goals, or standards do you set around productivity? Yeah, I think productivity is a hard one to, you know, to answer. Like, we don't have any specific metrics other than us, you know, so just the way that we work at Headway, we introduce constraints to the product team and try to, you know, adhere to like 35 hours, you know, on a project or, or a product and, you know, we're really measured by, you know, are we reading our, reaching our sprint goals or are we reaching our goals for the project? There's no like, you know, productivity index. We're not tying in the rescue time on everyone's computers and understanding like, hey, are they wasting time, you know, downtime here and there? I think each person can kind of speak a little bit to their own productivity if they want, you know, are they using Pomodoro techniques or are they using, you know, some other technique. I, I know a lot of people mentioned, you know, being mindful of their time and, you know, getting out during lunch and, you know, getting productive, getting away from your workstation. There's some really good tips there, but as far as measuring goals and metrics, I think that really depends on, you know, are we delivering the outcomes for our customers that, you know, we said we would, and if not, you know, how do we get there? Awesome. Yeah, there, there was one uh, comment I saw. Someone, uh, Sarah, asked about working in sprints. So maybe that kind of helps identify the productivity of each week. You know, obviously, we do work in sprints. Uh, maybe you want to speak to that a little bit. Sorry, what, what was that, Jacob? Oh, um, Sarah was asking if we work in sprints. And that oh. obviously, that would help us identify, like, productivity you know, or if we need, you know, why is, you know, is this project getting on time or is it taking longer or is one person having a hard time moving forward? You know, how do we handle that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think that's, you know, usually by the project lead or, you know, a product manager or somebody, you know, guides those sprints. But design, we work uh, a lot of times in one week sprints because we have more deliverables and can move a little quicker um, with what clients can review and what we can get in front of users. From a development perspective, it's more two week sprints. Um, yeah, so we do work, you know, in pretty structured sprints, you know, not always in that we're delivering something demoable, like on the design side, uh, but in just that we're showcasing our work and, you know, welcoming the feedback from teams, um, you know, as we go, even if that's collecting, you know, user research or collecting, you know, mood boards or things that aren't really design outputs, but are things that help guide our work and help, help us fill in those gaps. Awesome. All right, we can move to the next one, I think. Um, let's see. So Keith asks, for those of you that have done both in office and remote, uh, in which scenario does your day feel like it goes by faster or slower? Um, and, and where do you feel most productive? Do you feel more productive at the office or at home? Um, who wants to answer that one? Whoever wants to go first. Yeah, Clint. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I think both. I, let me read. I would say, like the, the thing about working um, ver working at, at home versus working in an office space is that all the all the interruptions that are usual in a working space are subtracted. The water cooler talk, and you know, just the just the kind of natural community of being around folks, things that happen, conversations that come up, you don't generally have. Um, but then you also have kind of warring at you your own personal like disciplines. Can you stay off of Twitter? Can you stay off of Instagram? Can you stay off of Reddit, et cetera, et cetera? Um, for me, it's been a, uh, and, and this is actually a, um, a method I had started. Um, I had started in when I was working in an office was the using the Pomodoro technique and just working in chunks of time and then giving myself like five minutes to kind of relax, take a walk or whatever. I had started doing that in the office environment. So when I came to work, you know, remotely, um, I found that uh, it worked really well to try and just continue doing that. Um, and so I think as far as like the whole, um, you, you asked um, faster, slower, I think I generally can get not so much faster, but it's well fast too, but I think it's more about deep work is more attainable. It's easier to get into. Um, when you're working remote versus when you're in an open office environment or just even with a couple other people. Um, there are times though when I do like to kind of get out of the office, go to the 
a coffee shop and kind of work from just to be around folks because it's it's healthy, just a good idea. But I think like Kelsey's mentioned earlier, I can get into a groove and just be focused on work and sit in this chair for eight hours and that's not good either. So the Pomodoro technique is one of those things that like I've applied that um, that has helped me to have these kind of focused deep work sessions, but then I'm getting the, the, the ping every 25 minutes or 30 minutes or however long to get up, take a break, go for a walk, look at Twitter in that five minute kind of break or Instagram or whatever it is, and then come back into it. So that's, that's kind of been my experience. Awesome. Does anybody else want to, well, one other person want to comment on that? I yeah. can comment on that too. Either one. Get it, Alex. Um, all right. For myself, you know, it's, I'm definitely more productive in a remote setting. Um, I think the nice thing about having a remote setting is being able to be flexible. Like I'm a morning person, so I'm up by 5.30, Grant, I turn into a morning person even more with having kids, but by 5.30, 6 o'clock, I can hop on the computer for a couple hours, really kind of hammer through some stuff that um, I want to be focused, where it's like there's nothing on Slack, there's nothing really else going on, I can really just focus with that, and then um, take a little break, eat breakfast, and then come back to it when, you know, everybody's being mostly on Central Time or, or I'm on Eastern Time that, you know, by the time I get back, everybody's just starting their day, so I've had a couple hours to get some work done. Um, so that helps for me, and, and, you know, previously working in office, I know there's somebody on the call that I worked with actually in an office, you know, you can get distracted a lot. Um, and uh, that's, that's the one thing that's hard about working in an office too, is like you can sit there for five minutes and somebody can tap you on the shoulder, hey, what's going on or what's this, or ask, ask all these questions. So for me, for sure, it's, it's definitely uh, more, more productive being remote. Awesome. Stunt, cool. did you want to say something or? I think good? you covered it. Okay, cool. Um, all right, I think we can go to the next one. Um, uh, oh, so I had really quick, Jacob, oh. sorry about that, but I just dropped a link in the chat of kind of oh, yeah. the Pomodoro technique and kind of where it all started with for me was this uh, intelligent change uh, puts out this planner that is essentially built around um, that kind of time blocking and getting things done in a day. So there's a link in the chat. Awesome. Um, so before we lose track of it, there was a question in the chat that I don't want to lose. Oh yeah, go ahead. Do you ever work, do you work every weekday or do you just need to meet your weekly goal? It doesn't matter if you work at night or weekend. Um, so at Headway, um, we all generally work kind of core hours. Um, you know, so I think those vary a little bit, but the idea being, you know, for the bulk of like the middle of the day, um, everybody is typically online. Um, lots of flexibility in that as needed, you know, here and there. Um, but the idea is, you know, we don't want to have to be coordinating with everybody to schedule every meeting. Um, you know, people generally are, you know, as long as you're not scheduling a meeting with, with, Andrew stunts, you know, before he's normally awake in the morning, you know, or hitting people five, six o'clock. Um, the idea is that, the, you know, generally they'll be available. Um, I know a lot of people, like, I think most people get, you know, get their hours in over the course of, you know, typical working hours. Um, my wife's a teacher. So typically when she gets home at three 30, you know, I will be done. Uh, you know, and I'll pick up in the evening uh, when those, you know, when the distractions are eliminated and, and all that. Cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, all right, I think we can jump in. Keith has another question. Um, for the company, how is overall productivity? Is the pacing different? Like releasing features or deliverables to a client takes a little longer. Um, I don't know who wants to kind of talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about that. I sure. think that um, I, just from the assumption in the question where releasing features or deliverables to a client takes a little longer is, can, is a little bit off base. Um, as remote developers and as like a team that works remotely, I think we've got it to the point where we are probably delivering at a faster pace at this point in time. It's because we can extend those hours as a team. Like I worked with Jordan 
um, for a long time, and he works uh, on the other side of the country and starts much earlier than I do. So we cover on any given day like 12 hours for that entire day. So Jordan can be pushing work out all morning, and I can pick up on that work all night and be pushing it continuously without a break. Um, and the client doesn't have to know any of that, right? It just looks like we're doing a ton of work really quickly, even though we're both still working eight hours a day. Um, so I, I think we use a lot of collaborative tools too. Um, like we use Notion a lot. And so for a lot of uh, our client communication or any sort of outgoing communication, um, we try to use anything that we can collaborate on. So if Jordan drops it in the morning. Um, someone else can pick that up in the afternoon, and it really just puts on a good face for anyone that's working with us. Um, and we we deliver. I mean, I don't know. We've certainly missed deadlines, but I I would say we miss deadlines less consistently at Headway than at any other job I've worked at. So, yeah, and to add on with that, you know. Deadlines are always a moving target, but this is the first job where I don't think I have worked 60 hours a week consistently, um, especially with the productivity that we have. Um, and to me, that was honestly, that was the biggest draw to joining the headway team other than all of these lovely people. Um, I know this is kind of might be a question. I don't know if, um, Anybody asked it yet, but maybe just talking about Jordan, your experience finding remote work. Like, where do you, where did you look? Um, just kind of going off of that. Um, just as you said, it was the reason why you came to our team. But where did you kind of look for work before? What webs did you use? Certain websites? Did you kind of have referrals? Like, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Um, so I I always put Basecamp as kind of the gold standard for remote work companies. Um, my my mentor works for GitHub. Um, and being an hour away from Atlanta, like I've, I've trained myself to, to look for work remotely. Um, either we work remote.com or remotely.io, um, looking for companies on Twitter, uh, who are, are hiring for remote positions, which is actually how I found Edway. Um, and did you know, if you click on a Twitter ad, uh, all of a sudden, all of your Twitter ads and LinkedIn ads and Instagram ads are for that company. Um, and that is how I found Headway. <laughs> um, I clicked on a Twitter ad uh, on a Monday and had uh, my first interview with John on Friday because I think I saw probably 25 ads that week. Um, so, awesome. so, yeah, it, it's effective. As intended. All right, cool. Th yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Jordan. I was just kind of curious um, your experience with that. So. Um, cool. I think we can move on to another question here. Brittany shares, uh, how do you stay focused on your work all day? Do you find yourself on Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, a lot? Do you find different time zones challenging? Um, oh, wow. There's a lot of questions in here. Does anyone work with remote with their spouse? Okay. Let's, let's focus on the distractions first. Um, so does anybody have experience like, you know, when you first started working remote, did you have a challenge staying off of Twitter or Facebook or, or Reddit even, or whatever you do? Um, well, how did you kind of like solve that challenge? Um, or is it something that you still have to kind of struggle with? Just maybe talk about it. I can take a crack at that. So, you know, I think it, it depends. Like for me, I, um, when I first started working remote, obviously, what was that? Oh gosh, like seven, six years ago. Like I was, I mean, social media was big, but it wasn't like now it's insane everything. Right. But I, I tried to actually turn my phone on do not disturb is a big thing um, just because you're so focused and honestly working here too, like because we're so busy and there was so much to do all the time, like I don't have time to even think about it. You know, I can um, contest to and Andrew always and I always tease back and forth about it. I worked for a remote job that as a product designer, I had one task that took me through that the project was three months and it took me a week to do. And I had nothing else. To, I was bored and you know, I, I watch Netflix, I'll be honest, like, and it was, it was a horrible experience. Like, that's why I was so ready to move on from that experience and work with a company that, at least for myself, I'm such a, I want to go, go, go and get things done and I feel accomplished. So I think that was also a challenge the other way that because there was such less needed for production level as far as getting things done and a lot of stuff to do that it almost went, it forced me to go to that because I was just, I had nothing else to do. 
Um, even if I asked for more project or for more work, they didn't have it. Um, so I think that's also a hard thing too, is to balance that a little bit. But, you know, thankfully, I'm at Headway and, you know, we have a lot of work to do all the time, which is really good. And it's exciting and it's fun work too. It's not, you know, boring, boring stuff. So, um, so I don't know if that really answers the question, but like, to me, it's just really turning my phone off, do not disturb, disturb. And I think what even Clint said, like spending that time where you like, hey, I'm taking a lunch break, like spend your time doing it then. And then just go back to doing do not disturb and, and being focused again. Yeah, I think if I can add a little little color to this, you know, when we started Headway, we had been, you know, we had run other agencies and freelance for a long time and, you know, fell into the trap of there's always more hours, right? And I think when you have that mindset of, you know, um, hey, if the client asks for more, like we won't push back, we'll just spend more hours and it'll be fine. Um, you know, bid the mid, burn the midnight oil and like continue to go down the path of, you know, more is more when I think, you know, less is more. And so part of the reason I mentioned before, if you joined us early on, um, you know, introducing the constraints to the team and having that constraint for our client, like we don't, like it's very rare. And I would say only 1% of all projects we've ever worked on, we've gone over and above um, at a client's request to do more, uh, you know what I mean, in a given week. And I think, you know, there's things we learn and you're always learning on the job to, to push and um, understand what we don't know. And you're always learning new things and that's one line, but to consciously continue spending more and more time and 60 hours, 70 hours, 80 hours, I think is a trap. And so I think and part of our, our goal and, and my goal around you know us implementing those is to have these focus hours be the best hours that we can give. And then the rest, like we can spend with family, we can spend doing hobbies, we can spend doing other things. And I think that's a big part of it. And while we may not always get there, it's something that we're striving for. It's not like, a, um, you know, something that is, hey, it's just a dream. It's like, hey, every week we should revisit this. And when we look at time spent in the week, the next week we should understand why, you know, have a retro around like, well, how do we make this better? How do we decrease our time? And um, I don't know, I think that's just, just part of it. Like to make sure that you're focusing on, everyone wants to, to do good work. So if you can focus on the work and know you have a limited amount of time ahead of you in the week or the day, you're going to do better work versus, you know, falling into the trap of more of like, oh, I'll just do it later. I'll, I'll plug in like at midnight or I'll plug in like super early. Um, and if you're flexing time, that's totally fine. And that's encouraged. But if you're spending 16 hours at a computer consistently, like you're, you're probably in the wrong spot or the project's not designed right or something, you know what I mean, is wrong. And, and being able to identify that, I think is really important to be able to be focused, you know, during the day when you're working. Yeah, and I just wanna add something, even for me, um, as a marketing person, like social is kind of part of my job, but it can get kind of away, away from me sometimes. Um, but I think one thing you can do with that is like, if you are spending time on it, try to curate what you're, what you're doing on social. So like, for example, like if you're on Twitter um, a lot, like focus on communities that are around like your subject matter. So whether it's design or marketing, so you can learn and, you know, find cool articles or new tools that are available. So you're kind of, it's like you are spending time on social, but you're also kind of learning and, and becoming aware of like better ways to do your job. So it's not always a waste of time and it's, it feels, you can feel a little bit better about it. Um, and two, you can establish relationships. I mean, you can definitely get new work and new opportunities through social relationships. So I think it's managing like what you're focusing on those social channels and then limiting that time too. So it's there's nothing wrong with doing it. It's just making sure like you kind of change the guilt on it. Like, Oh, well, I know that I established a new relationship or I learned something new, even though I spent 30 minutes on Twitter today or whatever. So, um, yeah, this is like a couple of thoughts that I thought would be good to share. Um, um, Jacob? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a couple um, resources too. Um, oh, cool. I don't think these books will be like surprises oh, to anybody yeah. in this uh, company, but um, <laughs> these are really awesome books. This one especially, um, Deep Work by Cal Newport. Um, it, they're just basically the the why and how of all the things everyone's been talking about, like what makes you successful and, and productive, um, working remote or really working anywhere. Um, Cal Newport is just an amazing um, writer of these kinds of topics. And I highly recommend you pick up these books. And I'll, I'll drop them in the chat as well. Awesome, thanks for sharing. One thing that, just one quick thing too, uh, have two web browsers have one that's all work stuff and then have one that might be your personal stuff. So that's something that uh, someone did it with two laptops, but 
I was like, that seems a little excessive. So I think two web browsers is a, is a good way to do that. Just keep all your personal non-work related stuff off somewhere else um, and just not have it open while you're working. Tab control. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all the tabs in Chrome. <laughs> what is the, the Epichrome? Is that the one? Or is yeah. it, um, is that it? Yeah. Yeah, Epichrome lets you set up kind of custom builds of Chrome and have, you know, like we, I generally set up one for every client. So it's a Chrome uh, a version of, it's a version of Chrome just for particular clients. And so all the things I need for that person or for that client is in that Chrome uh, instance, I guess you would say. So I'll, I'll drop a link to that in the chat as well. Awesome. Thanks, Clint. All right. The, some of the questions were, um, uh, part of that was like working remote, like does your spouse work remote from home or maybe like, you know, dealing with, with family at home, maybe talk about that. I don't know if anybody wants to share their experience, like, Hey, I'm home or, you know, like my spouse also works at home or like if I have kids sometimes maybe half the day, how do you kind of figure that stuff out? Like, do you use daycare? How do you kind of figure that all out? Yeah, I can speak to that. So, I mean, prior, I didn't really have anybody home with me until this week. So that's been challenging because my daughter is now home with me. She's six and has learning targets. And then I have an older son who is 18 who is trying to graduate high school right now. So um, I think when you have other people in the home, just trying to establish boundaries and like if I'm in a meeting and my door is shut, that means you cannot come in and you can't uh, distract me or you can't ask questions, right? Um, and just in setting up those boundaries and setting up schedules with people. Yeah. Awesome. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so, you know, my, um, my two young kids and my wife actually stay home. They don't work remotely, but she stays at home and take care of, to take care of the kids. But, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, there's some times where, you know, I have to, scare the kids out of the room because they know I'm in the office or something. But I think that's the biggest thing is just, you know, people that are home having a space. Um, I think sometimes working at a kitchen table or in the living room, is just, you're not going to get work done. Let's just be honest. You know, it's, you're going to be distracted by some, so many other things. So having a way to um, find a space, I think is a big thing. Like even before I moved to the, where I'm at now, back in Buffalo, I actually had my office in a spare bedroom. So that was hard too, because like there was a bed there. So it felt like I was still in a bedroom. Like it never felt like I was in an office working. So really just um, making sure you have a setup where you're at, I think is a huge thing too, as part of that. And also establishing a rule like, Hey, if I'm in here, if there's people home, like, no, I'm working and the door shut and making sure the door shut help, you know, curb that distraction from little ones or other people as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Alex. All right, we can move on to this next one here. Uh, Ryan asks, what does collaboration generally look like on a project? Um, like concepting, digital whiteboarding, all that kind of stuff. Um, we have a couple different tools to use, but whoever wants to talk about it, um, depending on the project, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, we've used, uh, I mean, we do Figma basically for everything. Uh, we've used Whimsical quite a bit for planning. Um, uh, we've used uh, Envision Freehand for a little bit for sketching, but unless you have uh, one of these at home, it's like useless because you're trying to draw with a mouse. Uh, so it's kind of tough. Um, but I think like the tools are really are really good now, and it's really easy to um, get in there and start concepting some stuff up. We're gonna we're gonna try to try Whimsical's uh, wireframing tool just to give it a, a quick run just to see if it's worth spending our time. But I think it's the tools are in a really good spot and it's um, it's a lot of like, let's all jump in Zoom, let's all be in the one file together and kind of work together. Uh, we, a few team weeks ago, we had five designers in Figma build out an entire uh, platform for bird's eye and a design all in one day. And we were all working in the same file. So with a little bit of planning, you can really get a crazy amount of things done um, with everybody in one file. So um, they've really evolved a lot uh, in the last couple of years. Yeah, I think yeah. just uh, kind of to what I was saying earlier, I think it's, um, 
any tool that helps you to, to communicate clearly and over communicate, even if you feel like you've, you've said it this way. Uh, I think a lot of times we can, we can build stuff in Figma and we can, Figma allows you to build flows and drop comments and have feedback and all of this. But sometimes you also need to do something like a video walkthrough or something like that. So um, I use Loom, which is a free um, video uh, record. It records your web to your screen and lets you kind of walk people through and annotate the video and whatnot. And I found that that's really helpful just to um, just to explain things and to kind of like get your point across and show rather than just tell in a comment. Uh, so just something like that's a little bit more a little bit more intentional, um, but also I think helps to kind of bridge that gap where uh, a, a text message or a Slack message in a comment may not really get across what you're trying to communicate. Yeah, anybody yeah. want to talk about development maybe or, or just, or anything else? Who was that spoke up? Well, I was just gonna kind of build, build upon what, what Clint said. And then I'll yeah. pass to Andrew. But I think, you know, in collaborating with other designers, making sure, and Clay mentioned this, but like you show instead of tell. So a lot of times, like if you're working in the same file in Figma, instead of like, hey, like what if we did this and you try to describe it, I think it can fall short. But if you kind of lay out a pattern together, you can, you know, find a path forward that makes sense. And, you know, you're both using the same tool. You can, you know, show by example and say, I was thinking something like this instead of trying to describe it, you know, and you wave your hands on camera like this, um, you know, you're moving boxes and text around and colors and shapes. So I think that's helped as well. But yeah, I'll pass it to, to Andrew to talk a little bit about development. So a lot of our projects, we encourage pairing between developers that are working on any given team. Um, I mean, I pair it all the time with pretty much all of the developers on the team. Um, but if, let's see, we use two tools primarily. Um, if we can, we try to use Tuple, um, which is a screen sharing uh, software that's designed specifically for developers. Um, and it's kind of like uh, other screen sharing software that you've used, but it's got some nice features that let you uh, like handle click events and handle typing in pretty specific ways. Um, the other tool that we use a lot, and this is mostly for when we're developing, like, I don't know, we use a tool called Wemux a lot, um, and not all of the developers on the team use Vim and Tmux as uh, basically a, not quite an IDE. Um, but a lot of us use Vim and Tmux pretty much full time. Um, and so for those of us that do, we can have remote servers that we can Wemux into. Um, and then it Wemux allows us to share a Tmux session basically. Um, and there's a couple options for Wemux where you can have like your own profile. And so you, like what is presented from Wemux is your own customized version of Vim or whatever it is that you guys are collaborating on. Um, and that's super nice. And Wemux is very lightweight and very fast, but you, you don't get the video call or anything. You just get the, the Tmux pain coming through. Um, but we use either Tuple or Wemux pretty consistently. So any other tools? I'm not certain. I think those are the big dev ones. Yeah, and cool. if you guys want to learn Oh, too, the yeah. internet. We use the internet a lot, too. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I just also wanted to add that, you know, developers, we pair a lot, like, just to make new feature work or to be unstuck or help somebody else get unstuck. But somebody that I've paired with a lot on this call right now is Alex. In that, like, you know, he designed something. I implement it and then we need to get on and I'll say, is this working how it's supposed to be working? And, you know, being able to get that like immediate feedback is so great and being able to show like, well, I could have it do this or, you know, different things and just being able to jump on and, and do that and not have to send screenshots and describe what it's doing just to show it. Um, it's really helps with productivity. 
Yeah, and I think uh, thinking about that, like, hey, can, it's like scheduling that time to do that is important where, because if you don't, if you just keep tapping on Slack or like, hey, when can you meet an email or whatever, it doesn't help because sometimes people don't see those Slack messages because they're so focused on something or like then it unplugs them from whatever they're focused on now. So I think even for me with like marketing stuff or anything, it's like scheduling that time to check in every day for like five minutes. Hey, what's going on? I need help. Yeah, how about at two o'clock we meet on this and we can walk through it together. So I think that's something that we, we do well at Headways, trying to, we overly communicate and say, yes, I need help. Or when can you meet, you know, like setting that up. So it's not so, so random and like, and then it keeps all of us on track for the things that we normally have to get done. Um, um, yeah, I think we can move on to the next question. Um, uh, there asked, typically have a project manager for each project that is key uh, communicating with uh, our key communicator with the client who wants it I mean yeah I can I can take that um, we normally sorry that's my daughter just in case. Um, yeah we normally have somebody who's like the the lead of the project we don't have specific like account managers that engage you know everyone on the team that's doing the work from the client at all so you know, we, we really encourage deep collaboration. So all of our clients are invited into Slack with everyone that's on the team contributing. They're invited to Asana or Notion or wherever we're keeping notes to keep track. They're invited to Figma. You know, a lot of times they're setting up the uh, access to the different hosting and things that we're building on. So they always have the keys and know where things are at. Um, so we usually have somebody that's dedicated as the lead for that project, but that could be tech lead that could be, you know, a product manager, somebody that's playing that role, but not necessarily like a project manager that's only doing that. It's usually somebody who is helping lead some of the team's work and then communicating in those discussions with the client. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on that? Or otherwise we can go to the next one. All right. Uh, Next question, Dana asks, uh, do you find when working with clients they have resistance to using cameras for live chats? It seems that everyone in my work hates video chat. We're all working remote after tomorrow. Um, it's gonna get interesting. Any hints for convincing others to use video or maybe communicating the value of video and why they should have their camera turned on? It's, yeah, it's interesting, like depending on the client, like, like just today we're, and I, I don't know if it's like a regional thing, but I've noticed that more West Coast folks don't like to be on camera. I don't know, but we just try to encourage as much as possible. Um, and then, you know, say, and I think the more we show our faces, the more we communicate, it does, does happen over time. But for whatever reason, some people just aren't into it and that's okay. And we try to make it fun. Like, like Andrew right now, making his background look incredible. So you make people feel, you know, FOMO, you know, if you're sitting on a lot of toilet paper, like I am, you know what I mean? You can hide your location. <laughs> uh, oh, let me, let me actually turn this off. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, if you, if you are a team or have other people that you talk to off of the video, like encouraging them, I think is the best way. You know, we have clients that we work with that, you know, corporate innovation teams where their cameras are always off. You know, sometimes we ask them explicitly, hey, can you turn your camera off or camera on? It'll give us a better feel, you know, work better together and just to see you, even if it's not, you know what I mean, the best camera angle and some people are in a conference room by themselves. I just think it brings that more human element in. So, Dana, if you could, you know, encourage folks that are on your team, you know, more closely that you have a relationship with to who share their video, I think that's probably the best way to get people to share their video. And then maybe, you know, if you have a team leader or somebody like mention it to them, hey, I think it'll make us work better and, and understand each other better when we can see someone's face, their reaction, their mannerisms, and we can communicate more effectively. Uh, you know, I think making the ask is never weird. Hey, you guys want to share your video? And people are like, yeah, I guess I never really thought about that. You know, and then they'll pop it on. But I don't know if anyone else has any other tips and tricks on having people show their face. Well, I think part of it, I was going to say, I think part of it is, um, and I know I've heard other people that I've worked with, um, even in like a larger corporate environment that would work from home occasionally, but they just say, you know, 
dressing dressing for the job even if you're at home like don't be wearing your pajamas all the time like it's dress in a mental state basically so i think part of it is you know some people might like not like they may be in their pajamas on their couch and whatever and their productivity might be low but that's on them i mean unfortunately like so hopefully um people you just have good people on your team that are willing to um kind of dress for the job and show up mentally and and physically and in front of the camera I think that's a good pro tip for anyone that's new to remote is like get ready as if you're going to the office, but then like go to your desk and like it, it, it's, you know, pretty astonishing. Like if you come to the computer, let's say on a Saturday morning and you wanted to get something done, even if it wasn't work related, you're kind of like, nah, you know, you're not really in the mindset, but if you can, you know, get ready as if you're going to the office, shower, you know, whatever, whatever it is you do, get dressed and come to the computer. I think that that helps a lot. And really, yeah. if you're wearing pajama pants, nobody knows because you you really only have to be professional from about here up. But yeah, getting ready is probably probably better. <laughs> Very true. All right, cool. Um, so we'll go to this next one. Uh, Kevin asks: Are there situations or stages and projects um, or engagements in which you? don't you and if so you know versus using a physical whiteboard stickies or like using um versus um Miro and whimsical like. I mean we've done physicals we still will do physical things every once in a while we've done a lot more in the past the the hard thing is when you need it digitally then you have to take pictures of it all and then you bring it into your tools anyways so it's kind of like I wish I would have just done this digitally in the first place uh so I think like um, if you have like a shared TV space that you can cast to um, or screen share to be able to do um, things like using whimsical with everyone in the room and still doing it digitally. But if you need to use, have everyone in a room um, physically, but then still do the activity somewhat digital, I think it probably would work the best because there's so many times where it's like, oh, I wish we had a, picture of all his post-it notes oh we do and then you have to like zoom way in to see the one note that we wrote down in the lower left hand corner and then you can't possibly read what it says so yeah i think like too it's like if you have say you do the, the whiteboard set up in a physical room um you could have someone just taking notes the whole time so it's like kind of like as they're writing things down as people are sharing ideas physically you're documenting it all in real time so then it's it, you get the benefit of that physical sharing but you also have the documentation happening simultaneously. So I think that's a good option for that. Um, yeah, we, we do a lot of kickoffs on site. So we have a, a new project kicking off next Monday that was supposed to be on site. That's now remote, but I think, you know, part of that session is, you know, in digital tools. So we don't have to repeat that work. And part of that is, you know, sketching and we're on paper and we'll scan those into like Figma. Um, so I think just figuring out what, what the right thing is for your team. You know, are you collaborating mostly on site or mostly remote? I think for us, we have, so we moved into a new office last end of April, last May-ish. Um, we have a bunch of whiteboards throughout the space. I would say the ones in our conference room get used the most. There are ones that like we created a collaboration space with just a whiteboard and some chairs um, that really never gets used. And I think that is because we're collaborating so much remotely that that's like an afterthought now, which I think is really a really good sign that we're thinking remote first and that the physical tools we have are like, eh, like, nah, I'm good on that. You know, to be able to turn to Figma or Whimsical or um, other sketching tools that are online. Yeah. Um, there was one question I saw. Uh, I think that's all the questions in the Q&A, but there was a question I saw that kind of popped up in the chat uh, that was talking about like, you know, how do you self-regulate, keep a good schedule, um, but don't bring yourself out. He you talked about kind of working late into the night. Um, I think maybe talking about how we kind of manage our time as a team. I, I think one thing, you know, we, we try our best to work, you know, kind of between the eight and five, just because our clients are working during those times. But maybe if anybody wants to share kind of how they kind of handle that, like if they have to flex time and just making sure they're showing up for meetings, et cetera. I think, I think it's, uh, you know, like even the one day working from home, it's like pretending like you're going to the office. So like, uh, time blocking the time, uh, getting ready and getting in that mental state by like, you know, 
taking a shower, getting ready for work and jumping on um, and knowing that this is the time for work, uh, I think is really important to help stay focused. Um, and especially like at the end of your day, taking the time to plan your next day so that you're not spending the whole morning, like, how am I going to get ran? amped up, but like having an idea of like, here are the things that I want to accomplish that next day uh, personally helps me a lot. So like at the end of the day, I'll just open up a uh, to-do list or notion, leave a note like on my uh, full screen, like, Hey, here are the things I want to jump on right away in the morning. So that when I get down or in the office working, I know exactly what to do. Um, and I don't have to spend time kind of sort of getting ramped up. And then also like, if I'm going to check emails and stuff like that, I try to do that away from my desk, like maybe do it on my phone uh, upstairs while I'm drinking coffee or whatever, instead of doing that, uh, when I'm here to do work. Yeah. Jordan, I think you get your hand, hand up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I have two thoughts to share. Um, kind of what Billy was saying, like develop a routine, um, regardless of whether or not you go into an office. Um, with me, my partner and I share a car, so I have to drop her off at work every morning and pick her up from her work every afternoon. So it's just a matter of organizing our schedules to where I have enough time during the day to make sure I hit all the meetings, um, making sure that I'm available uh, for the rest of the team to work with, um, or if I have to come back after I pick her up and we've got some, um, some time after dinner or whatever to hop back on and get some work knocked out. Um, but also I would say if, if there's nothing in your life for, that's preventing you from starting your day later and ending your day later, make that part of your routine and don't feel guilty about it. Um, I, I used to work like that constantly. Uh, would get up at, you know, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, work from 11 to seven and then stay up all night playing video games, you know, and that was a long time ago last year. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but I was in my, my mid twenties. So, um, you know, it's, it's whatever is going to work for your, your lifestyle or the lifestyle that you want to have, um, build your routine around that. And, you know, if it, it as long as it's working for you, keep it going. Yeah. 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 Great. That, yeah thanks for sharing that, that, Jordan. Yeah. Kind of, you know, hinges on the type of company you work at and what their, you know, remote policies are and flexible schedules are. I think, you know, one thing that helped us is like reading remote, um, you know, by DHH, I think there might've been another author in there and then it doesn't have to be crazy at work. I think there's a time and a place for some of those things. Like you get into crunch mode and projects are inevitably launching where, you know, we have some right now where we're putting in more time than we'd like. Um, but I think like trying to learn from that so that next time we can prevent that situation, I think is, is important I'm trying to figure out, you know, as a team and not just, one individual or you know two individuals like as a team what can we learn about planning about setting expectations about being realistic with those kind of sets us up for success the next time around and so um, yeah I think it largely depends on you know if your employer is pushing you to work 80 hour weeks every week that's probably a good sign you might be at the wrong place yeah Jordan you got your hand up again or is that did you feel to take it down <laughs> All right. Um, do, you, do you need some hand sanitizer, Jordan? <laughs> we, had a, um, we had another question. Do you ever have any problems with people interpreting things over text the wrong way and swag on a, on a ticket, whatever? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. It's, uh, I think when all of your communication or, or the majority of your communication goes from verbally talking with one another to asynchronous or like some sort of synchronous written communication, then you have to start thinking about that communication just as much as you would the verbal communication. So like taking a step back and thinking about what you're going to say and slowing things down and not just typing the first thing that comes to mind. Um, or it, you just, it's just a switch in your mind to, to think about that. Our, our Slack channels are not, uh, I don't know, Facebook chats, right? Like they are a place to do business and we try to talk in a way that matches that. So I think, well, you know, most of the time we do. Yeah. Most of the, we, you know, we have some random channels and that's, you know, 
who knows what's going on in there. But I think, you know, as a leadership team too, we have a concept of like 2D, 3D and 4D like conversations, like 2D is through Slack, 3D is like, hey, we should hop on a video call because there might be some stuff between the lines that you can read. And 4D is like, hey, we should have this chat in person, you know, whatever possible. I think understanding like what those are and, you know, if you send something over Slack that could be misconstrued a certain way or text, um, I think it's kind of on you to say, hey, let's let's kind of nip this in the bud and like, let's have the hard conversation now and have those more frequently. And I think you'll get used to, you know, those for sure. I use an excessive amount of emojis. That's how I get my 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 point across so that people don't think I'm grumpy. It's just sparkles and smiley faces, I guess, most of the time. And 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 I'm the opposite. I've been told that my use of emoji sometimes uh, implies sarcasm, which may or may not actually be there. Yeah, and I think that the biggest thing is animated gifts. <laughs> I think the biggest thing is just like, you know, if you feel like you don't understand what someone's saying, just tell them like, Hey, I don't know what you actually mean here. Can you clarify? I think, you know, and then tell people like, Hey, if there's everything, anything I ever say, if you feel confused by it, please tell me. Cause I don't know sometimes if you're confused or not. So I think just like overly communicating to each other is like the important part. Like we kind of said in general with, with remote and even in person, like we need to communicate more often and bring up, any issues that are kind of consistent like okay how can we make this better and it's not gonna be perfect it's gonna be an ever-changing um thing we're all and we're all human we all make errors and mistakes so i think just constantly um working on the, the relationship part and how you communicate so yeah um part of yeah part yeah. of the show don't tell like approaches trying to I forget who said this, but they told me, you know, in every conversation, there's actually four conversations. There's what you said, what you thought you said, there's what they heard and what they thought they heard. And so there's so much room for error and interpretation in that, that if you can understand like what the best communication like pathway is, what the best medium is, I think that can avoid a lot of that, that miscommunication and making sure like, Hey, you said this, but can you just clarify for me and make sure we're on the same page and really making sure that you, stop and are intentional about understanding because you can assume what someone means even from the words even from a video like this so i think you know making it okay to pump the brakes and say hey explain that one more time just to make sure i'm following i think is super appropriate yeah um we have another question uh zachary asks when hiring a remote developer what attributes do you look for and is it different from hiring an office position I would say a lot. A lot of it is the same. Um, a lot of a lot of it comes down to first appearances. No different than in an office. So, are they showing up on time? Are they able to be on camera? Are they, you know, speaking clearly over video call? Um, you know, we do for the most part. We do all our interviews remote. Um, you know, even, I think typically even people who are going to work on site in the office have at least one remote interview, talk to somebody on the remote team, um, because that's how we interact with a lot of our clients. So that ability is, um, you know, incredibly important. Um, yeah, and I'll let somebody else jump in. You're going to go, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I don't really have to, you know, anything, anything more to add. I think it's just making sure that somebody is of the right mindset, you know, if they're on site or, or remote. And I think this is the big thing that we really embrace is just that ability to learn from each other and learn, you know, where we're wrong and how to move towards what works. I think just to, you know, not take anything personally, not be super filled with ego, learn new techniques, new tools, like learn from each other. And I think, you know, that's probably the number one thing, you know, from somebody is just trying to, to make sure that we all can work well together because what we work on doesn't matter as much as how we work together. And I think that, you know, everyone can attest to that if they've worked in toxic work environments, it's because a manager they had or a coworker they had like wasn't treating them right or the environment wasn't conducive to, to them getting where they wanted to be. And so I think just being you know, teachable, teaching others, I think is super important. And yeah, that's kind of it. 
Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would say too, from the developer side of things as the candidate, um, you know, it's a good opportunity for you to see how that company actually treats remote workers. Um, like when I had uh, one of my final interviews, I hopped on an interview, uh, a call with, with Stunts and Tommy and Ray, and I could tell that Tommy and Ray were across the table from each other. Um, but it was important for them to be on camera, even though they were in the same room with whoever the remote candidate was. And that, that'll that indicate, you know, you've got a, a company with a good remote working culture um, and they, they treat everyone the same, whether you're in office or remotely. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Jordan. Um, I don't think there's any other questions in the does anybody else have any more questions in the chat maybe um otherwise um i don't know it's been an hour and a half i don't know how much do we just keep going <laughs> i mean we could if anybody um let's see we have 15 folks still in if they want to do folks want to introduce themselves and maybe kind of share who they are, what they do, and kind of what they learned today? Maybe, or maybe if they didn't learn anything, if there's something they want to share with the community, that'd be awesome. We can, I can unmute you, and you can, you can go um, if that's okay. Otherwise, don't. If I unmute you and you don't say anything, we'll move on. So we'll see how this goes. Um, yeah, there, but, there, was, there was a really important question there: How early oh. is too early to crack a beer, St. Patrick's Day or no? Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> I I had one for the start of the call. I don't know if that, that answers the question. Yes, happy St. Patrick's Day. I totally forgot what day it was. <laughs> yes. Cheers, everyone. Um, awesome. So we'll go from uh, – so Bobby McDonald, I'm going to have you – I'm going to unmute you if you want to intro yourself and just kind of share who you are, what you do, maybe something you learned or something you'd like to share. Oh, does it let me do it? On mute, or is he trying to? Andrew, can you unmute him? I can't. Can you have, I could. We did have another question in. How often do you recommend meeting in person? I'm not. I'm not I'll sure. Never. If, I'm not. Yeah, right now. <laughs> um, for not for a long time. Yeah. Two weeks. I'm not. Sh I'm not sure if they're referring to as a team or. Oh. Like, um, well, I would practice social distancing, which is about six feet apart at all times if you're in the same room, um, under 10 people if you live in Wisconsin, and congregated in a confined area. No, but otherwise, we, we do have, uh, I, I don't know if, Andrew, you want to share, we do have um, two like team retreats a year to get our whole team together um, to kind of get that camaraderie and get be in the same place at the same time and, and work on relationships, you know, beyond the remote. Uh, cadence that we have um, yeah we found that I think you know I mentioned we a lot whenever possible we try to do on-site kickoffs whether we're going to a client or um, you know they're coming to us in, in Green Bay I think it's always good to start off building that rapport going to eat you know having some conversations that are aren't just about the project and getting to know people um, but yeah we moved recently from three team weeks to two this year unfortunately we are skipping the one that we're on. This was supposed to be in Green Bay, um, streaming from there, but glad everyone's safe. And then, you know, we're, we're kind of moving to some time off around the 4th of July instead of the team week, just to kind of be mindful where we have, you know, one team week that's in the office that's more heads down, and then one team week that is kind of on-site destination somewhere else where we're not really, we don't really have any work outputs or anything from a from an output perspective other than, building our, you know, team up together. All right, let's see if we can unmute. I think, so I was trying to do it in the attendee panel. Let's see if I can do it up here. It doesn't let me unmute. Andrew, can Bobby, you? No, Bobby, Oops. are you able to unmute? I just texted like, Oh, there we go. It's like, got him. Looks like he I, dropped off. That's Kevin. I got, that's okay, I got somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you got his brother, Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, I, I can go for Bob. He texted me that he had to drop off because my dad just visited him. So, um, but yeah, I, I can kind of go in his place and then, um, but yeah, um, I think 
you know, myself and Bobby, we work on the same UX team. So I think a lot of what we would share would be pretty similar, but a lot of this, you know, everything you guys said, I, I would, it definitely resonates with kind of our experience as kind of remote designers. Um, you know, we worked in the office and I think everything from productivity, um, you know, to, you know, some of the pros and cons of working at home versus the office, I think we're, you know, completely spot on. So uh, learned some new tools that, you know, you guys shared in the chat. So interested to explore some of those. Um, really like the remote first mindset um, that you guys have um, working at Liberty. We're a huge company and there's so many, it, it varies people's, um, people's preferences on kind of how they communicate and collaborate differ across the company. Like some folks are very business oriented and they're very like, you know, they're co-located in the office, they go in every day. So like, you know, if I join a call, I'm the one person, you know, kind of sitting on the TV, everybody else is in the room. So like, I've been on that side of the fence, you know, you know, having it challenging to kind of fight for my way in as a remote um, participant. So, um, you know, um, you know, I, I really like the remote stuff. I also kind of like doing some of the in-person physical stuff too, but also try to be mindful of, you know, the remote um, team as well. And I try to over communicate too. So um, yeah, great stuff. Um, thanks again for everyone staying on later uh, for the day as well. So um, good stuff. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for sharing that. We appreciate it. Um, it looks like uh, I just told people to raise hands. There's a little icon you can select to raise your hand as an attendee. Um, looks like Sarah. We're going to have Sarah go. Oh, is someone else unmuting? Because I feel like I'm clicking. And then there we go. All right, Sarah. Yeah, sorry. I think I was competing with you. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sarah Lee, I'm very near Andrew Stunts. I'm an anacortis. So you're just across the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really appreciate you guys putting this together. It's I've worked with a remote company uh, most of my work experience. And I'm actually, my husband and I both work from home. So this is going to be a challenging next six weeks with kids. <laughs> uh, trying to balance work and, and family life is interesting. And it's just really interesting to see how other people do it as well. Appreciate you guys sharing some of the tools you use. I've, you know, we've really found UX pins been really helpful to, it's great to be in there at the same time with other members of our team. Is that something you guys have ever used? I uh, maybe I'm the only one unmuted now. <laughs> no, no, I'm, no, I'm sorry. I was going to see who's going to answer. Sorry. Yeah. It looks like Billy dropped off. Um, yeah, we've used UX pin before in the past. I think now for a lot of most things, our tool of choice would be Figma. So we'll, we'll usually start with like a design system in there, even if, you know, we take away some of the high fidelityness of the components and we'll, we'll do a lot of wireframes and stuff in there and then kind of push the level of fidelity on those as the project progresses, but have used UX pin before, uh, definitely. How do you feel it compares to Figma? It's, that's a new one for me. I've done sketch and then I moved to UX pin and is Figma kind of comparable to the both or? Would like I would to? say, yeah, and, you know, Figma, I think, does a lot of the smaller things really well. I think they have a staff of designers on their team that really use the tool day to day and think about how it would make their experience better. So I think they do a really good job of um, making small incremental changes every, I mean, week, it seems like they're coming out with new things like auto layout and things that make um, design much closer to development and then allow us to cut down on like a lot of rework. And so I don't know if UX pin has design libraries and systems now, but that's what we've been doing quite a bit to help us really accelerate how we build UI, you know, using atomic design principles and then how we transition that to um, storybook. There was a session we did a while back between uh, design systems and, or design and Figma and storybook and how those two play together. I think Jacob, is it on our YouTube yet or it's coming soon? It's coming soon. Yep. There's the, there's the pressure <laughs> for him to get it up, but know. you know, and then you can see a little bit more about how we use, you know, Figma in design and then how does our dev team bring Figma into storybook and the components that we're building. And um, I think it, it'll help give you kind of bridge the gap between design and development. Yeah, I know it's definitely something I'll, I'm going to check out a little bit more. I think it offers that collaborative work that we found so difficult with Sketch, and that's why we'd kind of moved to UX Pin. Like, like being in the same document at the same time. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks. I'll let somebody else pitch in. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. We appreciate it. All right. Uh, looks like Natasha is up next. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Natasha. Uh, I'm a designer. I so I, I actually currently work remotely for an interactive agency that is based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I moved from Louisiana to Madison, Wisconsin back in August of last year. Um, and I'm in the position of being the only remote person. Well, I mean, now for this, for the coming weeks, I'm not the only remote person anymore, but before that, the only remote person on my team at all, uh, because I've been in this job for almost five years. So my boss, when I told him I was moving, he actually was just like, Hey, how about you just work remotely because we already know like how you work and the quality of your work and all of that. So just keep your job. So I did because it was easy. That's and awesome. I didn't have to look for a new job. Um, but it's definitely a challenge being going from being around my coworkers every day to being the only person that is not in the office and missing out on a lot of the conversations that are happening, like I'll get pieces of conversations on Slack when people send reference links, um, but then I'm missing the context. And when they say things like, oh, cake in the kitchen for somebody's birthday, things like that. So it's been interesting to get used to that. Um, but uh, we currently mostly use Sketch for our designs in terms of prototyping, but I, and I've heard of Figma, I know it exists, but the way that y'all talk about it, I might have to look into it a little bit more and see if it would be a better tool for our team, especially since we have me working remotely and then we have all of us working remotely for the foreseeable future with everything that's going on. So definitely learn yeah. some things in this yeah, session cool. today. Yeah, you'll find that once you start to use Figma, um, I think just they're, they're leaps ahead. And I think Sketch is catching up. They're, they're kind of always kind of, the tools always seem to kind of, you know, try and catch up with each, with each other. But um, what we found is that Figma is in, encompassing, kind of does all the things uh, within one where Sketch is kind of dependent on certain other things to kind of um, get things across like prototyping or, or uh, even like using Zeppelin or using, you know, um, envision whatever it may be. Um, you'll find that Figma is um, is uh, kind of meets all those needs in one. So I think it's one of the big bonuses that we found. Plus the teamwork aspect of being able to be in the same file at the same time and kind of see everything that's happening and, and have uh, real time collaboration. So and we have some videos and some you and some blogs on uh, getting. We started. do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we do. We yeah. can share some of that stuff. And in Figma, we have, I think, later this week or early next week, maybe the week after, we've got a UI kit called Shipwright that we've been working on internally that we start all of our new projects with. And so it starts with uh, atomic design principles, and we're looking to empower Kelsey, Andrew, Jess, and other folks from our dev team, Jordan, um, where we'll be able to create like a full design system where we have a UI kit in Figma, we have React or live view components, <laughs> like as starting points to be able to, you know, really focus on the business value we're creating for clients and not, you know, hey, we're creating a button over and over again. And here's how it looks. Cool. Yeah, I will definitely look into your resources and then see about introducing them to my team. It's interesting. We, um, we have, we've had a bit of a team boom in the last couple of years, we went from myself being the only designer for a little while back in when I first started, so almost five years ago, to now we have four designers and three developers and like an, a total team at the agency of 21 people where it was eight people when I started in 2015. And so it's been interesting to try and accommodate for that type of growth with our processes and what we use for software. Like right now, I said we mainly use Sketch for prototyping and then we use Envision for presenting to clients. Yeah, 
And uh, Natasha, I think, yeah, I remember, I think we were talking on Instagram or something, but yeah. hopefully, hopefully one of these days you can come up to Green Bay when all this craziness is, is gone um, and come visit us and come to one of our events or something. So it'd be awesome. Hopefully. Yeah. I was even yeah. going to drive up, but then everything happened. Mm -hmm. And so I am obviously just at home right now. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we look forward to it. All right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. All right, everyone, move on to the next person. Um, I think it's just Dana's left here. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. I am Dana Baim. I am a developer at Schneider, and we are going to be starting working remote on Friday, and I liked your advice on staying focused because I will admit that in my previous times from working from home during snowstorms, I am the least dedicated remote worker. I go to the kitchen to get coffee and then I do a load of dishes Then I need to get some more, get another beverage to restock the fridge. So then I do a little laundry, you know, and as I walk around the house and do different things, I easily get distracted because I'm normally not working from home. So some of the ideas of just getting ready in the morning, like I normally would, and then sitting at my computer, I think are going to be some, you know, big things to help me focus and just recognize, you know, even though I'm at home, this is work and it's time to work. So that's going to be my uh, biggest focus coming up in the near future here. So I definitely appreciate all your advice. And then like that, just trying to get um, more personal level with our team as we collaborate over the distance, because we're so used to our team is primarily in person. So that'll yeah. definitely change. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. I, I think too, like something, especially with the recent situation with a lot of people, I think, you know, don't like beat yourself up too much. Like give yourself some grace. Like this is a new habit for you. This is a new work environment, like a new routine. So to, it's going to take a little, a couple of days or maybe even that first week to like, be like, well, how do I get a hold of my day? Oh, maybe next week I'll try this instead. Um, so just something to think about like, it's not going to be an easy change um, and it just takes time to figure out like what works for you. So, yeah. Yeah. It'll be an adjustment. That's for sure. Cool. Anything? Did it, yeah, for sure. Anything else you want to share, Dana? No. All right. Cool. Thanks, Dana. All right. Thank you to everyone. All right. So anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody else that wants to to um, uh, share share anything? We got, I think the webinar thing ends at eight, so I think we have to stop pretty soon. Otherwise, we'll get cut off. Um, yeah, I got a roll, but uh, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Good, good to meet everybody and talk with everybody. It's awesome. Yeah, thanks, Clint. We appreciate it. And yeah, thanks, everyone. Let us know if you have questions. Uh, reach out to us on our site, ahoy at headway.io, or whatever makes sense to you. Jacob mans all of the social um, things we do. So Twitter, Instagram, whatever whatever makes sense. And yeah. you know, we'll provide out some of the links and resources that we put together uh, and that we talked about today. So yeah, thanks for coming, everybody. We appreciate it. Stay yeah. safe. Yeah, yes. thanks for having it. Stay safe, stay home, and prosper. Yeah.